I need to have uh, I need to have Bill stand up. Bill, do you know why you're standing up? No, but but you get another guess. That's your prize. Because you're what? You you are awesome, and and it's also your birthday, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So we're gonna sing Bill Happy Birthday. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bill. You're awesome. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Bill. And there's the hug. Wow. One leg up and everything. That was awesome. Did anybody get a picture of that? We'll send it to Jason. That was beautiful. That was a great thing. All right, thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Um, it means a lot to me that uh, you, that you guys are here. I mean, it's uh, it's it's early on a Saturday, and and last night was was brutal for a lot of people. So I think everybody that's in this room absolutely wants to be here, and I think that's that's cool. So thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I'm Johnny Long. Uh, for those of you that have seen my intro, I apologize, uh, but I kind of feel like whenever there's somebody that's new. I have to tell them a little bit of the story to catch them up to kind of where we are. And uh, this talk is, is really about uh, Hackers for Charity and kind of where it is, uh, where we've come in the past year, where we've, uh, where we've moved in the past six weeks. And uh, I think for those of you that kind of don't know the whole story, you'll be at a bit of a loss if you don't know how this whole thing went down. So anyway, uh, the story, at least for me, starts back in 2004. Um, and it started uh, not at DerbyCon, but at DEF CON. And uh, I was, I was uh, amazed to be giving a talk at DEF CON because it was kind of the culmination of my career. You know, I had worked in uh, InfoSec and, and pen testing and all that for quite a few years. And everybody that was anybody would speak at DEF CON. So getting a slot at DEF CON to me was just this really huge deal. And, uh, you know, I showed up and I gave my talk and I was Mr. Man, you know, I was like full of myself and, you know, my speaker badge, you know, and everything. And, you know, I didn't really even talk to anybody on my way to the podium, you know, because I was a speaker, you know. And uh, my talk absolutely was terrible. It sucked. It was it was awful. I, I Somebody actually dug that up and sent me a link to them and I tried to have them killed. That didn't it was not it was not a cool thing. But the result of that experience was that, you know, I was I was just pretty miserable about the whole thing. Um, so much so that it really made me kind of look at my life and, and, you know, man, I worked all these years to get to this spot, you know, to give this talk at DEF CON and it was just so terrible. And I'm like, man, I worked my whole life for this. And uh, what, I, what I like to say is that um, I, I committed a form of online suicide by writing this on my blog. You know, because I, I, it was kind of a spiritual experience for me. You know, I, I fell flat on my face after lots of hard work. And, you know, whether it was, you know, my upbringing in a Christian home or whatever, I really felt like this was the fallback, you know, to, this was my safe spot. And um, like, I, like I always say, I kind of had this prayer. I was like, hey, God, do something with my life. <laughs> you know, I was, I was at the bottom. You know, I was really miserable about that. And... Um, I call it suicide because I really didn't think that there was, you know, there was any room in this community for somebody that's, you know, this like Jesus freak, <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know. And so that's to me, it kind of felt like a, a bit of suicide. But uh, honestly, um, you know, the community, this community is pretty unique in that um, not only do we not have geographical boundaries, um, we, we don't really have spats about spiritual topics and religion and all that kind of stuff that you see in a lot of other communities, uh, you know, we're about technology, we're about hacking, we're about security. And um, so that little, you know, suicide thing kind of failed. <laughs> and no, everybody was like, yeah, so what? <laughs> you know, it wasn't, wasn't really a big deal. But I kind of I feel like that prayer for me was answered because my career blew up. You know, I, I got author, you know, uh, publishers emailing me and saying, hey, do you want to write some books? And man, I wrote books. <laughs> I wrote books like absolutely crazy. Um, then the press landslide happened and, you know, I was on all these TV networks and all this crazy stuff. And this was the birth of Johnny Long, the Christian ha hacker, pirate, ninja author, you know, all these, all these crazy, you know, titles. This was, 
this was me. And so around this time, uh, by now we're up to like 2007. I had a, a really good run of like three, four years where I was just doing this crazy stuff, writing all these books, doing all this, this TV stuff. And uh, I, I went full cycle and got to the top again. <laughs> you know, I, I did all this crazy stuff. And wouldn't you know, I ended up miserable again. <laughs> got to the top of the mountain and I was just like, ah, this kind of sucks. I, I, like, I felt like I did everything there was to do. And then right about that time, uh, my wife Jen went on a short uh, missions trip to Uganda, something she's always wanted to do, and came back with pictures of, uh, this is Colin, um, these kids in Uganda whose parents were dead, you know, they, they didn't have clothes, they didn't have food, they were starving, but they had these big smiles and they danced and, you know, and they saw her and tried to hold her hand and, you know, and I was like, you know, the kids living in a, in a place like this, you know, and he is absolutely happy. He's filled with joy. And she brought me these pictures and these videos and I was like, what does this kid in Africa have that I don't, you know? And so that's kind of where the, the Uganda thing started was with my wife going over there and doing that. Um, and of course, once I got there and they found out I was a computer guy, that's yeah, actually the term that they used was computer wizard. They put me to work repairing computers and, um, it turned out that lots of people who had donated to Uganda, one of the, the poorest places on the country, were bringing computers to help them keep their books and to keep their records. You know, and it would come with a free like one week training course before the volunteer would dash back to the safety of the US. And of course, once the thing broke, it was broke for good. And the spreadsheet would be broken and then the volunteer that brought the computer to help them manage their money couldn't keep in touch with them anymore with their spreadsheets and the money chain would be broken because they didn't have anybody to do tech support. And so I did tech support for like two weeks on all these different computers for all these, all these nonprofits. In Uganda, they're called NGOs, non-government organizations. Fixed up their stuff, you know, literally cleared plants out of desktops and, you know, did antivirus and replaced hard drives and actually booted machines with floppies because they were running Windows 95 and all this hideous stuff that I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about. But it was an amazing experience because these little crap skills that I kind of thought were the bottom of the ladder made a huge difference for these people. And specifically at the end of two weeks, they told me I was saving lives because I reconnected that money chain back to these kids who were dependent on support from donors all over the world. And I came back from that and I started Hackers for Charity as a result of that because I thought, man, if I could do this by myself, wouldn't it be great if we could pull a bunch of other people together and do it on a bigger scale? Um, and people supported this idea, you know, at least in theory. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with um, them agreeing with my spiritual standpoint or anything like that. It was just really about doing something positive. And I had seen that before. I had seen hackers sending money to Red Cross and going down to hurricane zones and setting up comm systems and doing all this stuff. But I didn't know of any charity that specifically focused on technology. So this thing seemed like a really good idea. And I did everything I could to run it and help Uganda and do it from the safety of my home in the US and that failed <laughs> miserably. Um, in fact, um, for me, it was, it was kind of a spiritual thing where I, I felt like God was just saying, go to Uganda, go to Uganda, go to Uganda. And it just became this, this thing where I was like, all right, shut up, I'm going. And the funny thing was, it was happening to my wife too. Um, and we just didn't know why. But in 2009, we packed up, we went to Uganda, took our kids, um, we relocated for basically what was supposed to be a year in 2009, quit my job, um, got fired from a job which was supposed to support us while we were in Africa, that's a different story. And literally we left penniless, no savings, um, a house that a mortgage payment was due on with no renter, and we just went. And uh, you know, that took, um, that took a lot, um, it, you know, it took a lot to take that first step. But what was really cool is that people like you, uh, donors would send us money to support our efforts over there to kind of keep us afloat, um, which, was, which was pretty amazing. But it did take like a year um, to kind of figure out what we were supposed to do. And in that year, we found a couple things that we kind of looked at and we said, okay, this is what we're supposed to be doing. The first thing was providing tech support to the nonprofits over there. I knew that from the beginning, from my very first trip. The second thing was to provide computer training, um, not only to the staff of the nonprofits and the locals, you know, who were 
working for the nonprofits, but just anybody that wanted computer training. Uh, bandwidth was starting to improve. The internet had you know, made its way to Uganda and there was nobody to do training except businesses who were charging a small fortune, upwards of three months worth of a standard salary to take a one week class. So people had come in and maximized on this opportunity and turned it into a business so only the rich could take computer classes. So that was the second thing. The third idea that, that we kind of had was opening an internet cafe to kind of support the travelers that would come over. You know, they'd come over with their Macs and they'd come over with, you know, their iPhones and all this stuff and they're expecting to be able to blog and to send photos and they couldn't do it because there weren't any decent internet cafes and I thought, well, I know a little bit about computers so that might be something I could do. And then the fourth thing that we kind of thought about was um, to really directly address the poverty as we saw it in our own lives. You know, there's, there's orphans all over the place and street kids and we kind of didn't know what it was, but it seemed like when we had opportunities, we should try to help. So those were kind of the four things. Um, it panned out that um, our, the two major initiatives were our computer training center, which you see in this photo, and the internet cafe turned into a full-blown restaurant. Um, and that happened because I kept saying, we're gonna do an internet cafe. And then it was like, we'd get a coffee machine from Italy, you know, $15,000 top of the line Italian espresso machine dropped in our laps for next to nothing. And I'm like, no, no, it's supposed to be an internet cafe. It's like, okay, well now it's a coffee shop, <laughs> right? And so I started looking for a place to set up my little coffee shop and I found a closet on the main drag in Jinja which is a tourist town and it was like 900 bucks a month for this little closet. And I'm like, oh, this is great, this, this will be fine. And then I find this place for the same price, you know, one street off of Main Street. And I'm like, that's kind of big, <laughs> that's kind of fancy, that's kind of nice. And so the internet cafe fit in like, you know, a tiny little corner of this place. And I'm like, it's gonna be an internet cafe. And then we got a caterer who came to us looking for work who had catering experience and cooks and baristas and it was like, okay, fine, it's a restaurant. No experience whatsoever in running a business or doing a restaurant, but we kind of knew that there was a big need for it. Not just for the internet and selling coffee, which is a natural combination, but for like American food. Cheeseburgers, french fries, milkshakes. I'm like, this stuff isn't hard, we can do it from here and kind of serve the community of people that's coming over. And in the back of my mind, I thought, this is how we're gonna live, right? We're gonna make money off this restaurant thing and it'll float us when all our donors go away. And that was kind of the plan. Um, so, uh, basically, uh, DerbyCon last year was absolutely amazing. Um, those of you that were here, uh, you know this. Those of you that weren't, you heard about it and here you are. Um, but DerbyCon was amazing for us as an organization and for me personally. Um, it really kicked me in the butt, you know. It made me want to get back to Uganda, you know, and use this momentum to do amazing stuff. We raised a lot of money. We had a lot of people saying, what you're doing is awesome. We're buying your shirts. We're telling people. And I was like, man, I'm going to go back, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work. I'm going to work hard. And, and that was my response. My response was this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoulder this like load of, you know, all this stuff and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push HFC, PUA, I'm going to go. Well, the list of, the list of problems um, was fairly lengthy. Um, the, first, the first was that uh, we were on the backside of several classroom projects failing. I had this brilliant idea of building computer labs inside existing schools and I watched that fail. Um, they didn't know how to take care of the computers, the training, they, they weren't really keen on taking the training, on maintaining it, and so we'd put tens of thousands of dollars into a computer lab and watch it sit and grow mold, you know, and, and I was like, this isn't working. So in some cases, I'd reclaim the equipment, so I'm sitting on this big pile of equipment, and I was like, okay, failure number one. And another problem we ran into is we'd, we'd have our employees stealing from us, and we're talking millions of shillings you know, in local currency, stolen right out from under us, you know, in a couple different ways. We had former uh, employees and people making threats against us um, and taking legal action against us. Um, the Keep, that restaurant that we started, and the training center, neither one of them were making any money. You know, neither one of them were, prof were profitable. And the one that bugged me the most was the restaurant because I'm like, that's our plan. <laughs> that's, that's how we're going to make this. Um, 
neither one of them were making money. Um, our family wasn't, um, it, our living expenses weren't ex sustainable. Um, we didn't have the money that we kind of needed to survive. Part of that was because I have never taken a salary from HFC. We'd use the donations for the work on the ground. And then if somebody says, hey, Johnny, I want to support your family, then we would, you know, put that aside and we, that would be part of our donation, you know, to live. Um, and the last thing was that it was, you know, kind of a one-man show. This is the list of problems that I faced when I got back from DerbyCon. Um, but in that whole list of problems, the, the one that I focused on was my family's sustainability. In my mind, it was, it was logical. It was like, well, I got to look out for my family because if we don't have the support to stay over here, I can't really do the rest of the stuff. Um, and those of you that kind of read the blog, um, you know that I took a position with offensive security. Um, OFSEC is an amazing team. They've been amazing friends of ours, uh, huge supporters of HFC. Those of you that, that know OFSEC, you know what they do. Um, they do amazing work. Backtrack is killer. The, the Backtrack community is amazing. The training is great. And um, they kind of slowly and carefully made me a job offer. And it involved me working part-time from Uganda and getting a salary. And then, you know, the rest of the time I could do HFC stuff. And I jumped all over that. Um, I absolutely jumped all over that. Uh, it was challenging for me. Uh, there was stuff. I was teaching the PWB course, the pen testing course. And uh, there was stuff in that course that I had never done in the 15 years of doing InfoSec. For example, writing my own buffer overflow. People would start talking about overflows, and I'd be like, that's our coder. I'm the team lead. You go talk to him, because you're talking about, you know, knob sleds and crap, and he speaks that. <laughs> but I had never done it. So I had to dig in, you know, over a period of uh, several months and learn how to do this. This was tough territory for me. I had to get into something that I did not have any experience with and just tackle it. And I did. Um, that sort of culminated in Black Hat, just this past Black Hat, where I taught the PWB course. I was the lead instructor for the PWB course, and it rocked. It was just the best experience of my life. After being in Uganda for all these years, kind of atrophying and not doing much technically, I was like, back. I'm like, I, I, all the old stuff came back just like that. You know, I got into overflows and a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. I didn't get sniped at all in the class, and, you know, and I, anything that came at me, I was able to, I was able to handle. It was, it was just, it was just killer. It was great. It was a huge high, um, and I had conquered something. You know, it felt great. But if you're paying attention to the time frame, you realize that the time frame between DerbyCon and this past Black Hat is about a year, right? We're talking September to August, and that is where I spent most of my time was with OFSEC. Um, in, in the plan was to support my family, but along the way, what happened was my 20 hours a week ended up flatlining me, so I didn't have anything left for HFC. And um, by the time we got to DEF CON, the weekend after Black Hat, my high disappeared. Um, and essentially, I found myself answering questions from people the same way that I had answered them for the past three years. For example, HFC sounds great. What can I do to help? It was the number one question that we've been asked for the past three years, and the answer has always been the same. Um, money? <laughs> Send me money. And then on the side, you know, I, I could sometimes say, you know, and if you want to support us, <laughs> send me money. And that was always the answer. Um, and that really affected me because when I got back from DEF CON, um, I found things to be in a real mess. You know, we're talking, what, six weeks before Derby Con. Um, I found things in a real mess. Um, our personal donations, the stuff that floated us was at an all-time low. You know, people, uh, I wasn't blogging much. I was doing the offsec thing. People were kind of like, well, I don't know if he's doing the HFC thing or not, so I'm not going to really send them money. Um, our expenses were at an all-time high. In the, the midst of being in Uganda, we, we uh, a lease ran out on our house, which was very reasonably priced, and when we went shopping for a new house, we found that our rent was about to triple. And around that time, 
we had some money coming in and it was fine. So we, we paid this triple rent and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff happened. Um, HFC, like I said, was absolutely completely stalled. And worst of all, worst of all, when I got back from DEF CON, I realized that Derby CON was looming. It was coming. And I would have to get up here on this stage and tell people, you know, hey, thanks for your support last year. Um, let's do it again. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, that's my talk. I'm thinking that. I'm like, you know, all these people supported what we were trying to do, put all this effort into the fundraising and everything, and I had nothing to show for it. Um, I, at this point, I was kind of really well outside my personal belief system. Um, you know, I, my priorities were completely all messed up. Um, I was all turned around. I was completely off track. My sense of purpose was kind of offset, you know, I, all these failures and everything. And as had happened several times in the past, um, you know, my, des my desperation, you know, had me doing, you know, talking to God, <laughs> you know. And I heard some stuff. It, it's not like the big voice you hear in the movies or whatever. You know, but for me, it was just a couple simple things that I heard very clearly in kind of that inner voice. This was the first one. Get your priorities straight, right? Get things, get your, get stuff in order. Um, now, that meant a lot of stuff to me, but one of the things was HFC. I'm not going to go into all the, the messy personal stuff that that involved, right? Because there was some personal stuff in there, but the big one was HFC. And this was completely clear to me. It was that I was supposed to focus on HFC. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, I got six weeks until Derby. I'm really supposed to be focusing on Hackers for Charity. How much can possibly happen? Um, and the one, the one thing that popped into my mind was I was like, wait, does this, what does this mean exactly? Like, um, and, and here's how my discussion went. <laughs> If you can kind of imagine this discussion happening, it was this was this was me. Well, if I don't work, meaning if I if I focus on HFC, I don't get money, right? That's me. Here's the response, right? And and I said, okay, let me take this a little farther. I need money to survive. I'm trying I'm trying to lay things kind of out here. This is the response, <laughs> and then I'm like, okay. So what you mean is that I keep the offset gig and I work really hard with HFC, right? You know, I'm trying to formulate where this is going. And this is the response. And so I countered that with, what if I just, and this was the response. <laughs> really what I was feeling like was, I'm supposed to quit everything right now and focus on HFC because that's why I'm in Uganda. That's why I'm there, is to do all that stuff. And yeah, I, I kind of do feel like God was calling me stupid. <laughs> um, and in the weeks leading up to DerbyCon, the past six weeks, I basically engaged in something like this. <laughs> um, I had no idea what I was expecting. It seemed really foolish. Um, it seemed like a really dumb thing to do. But it was amazing because the results were immediate. I talked to Mutz and I was like, dude, I feel like I got to take a vacation or do something. Um, I got to focus on HFC. And he was like, that's cool. You just let me, give me a call after Derby, Derby Con and we'll talk again. I was like, sweet. So like day one of focusing on HFC and this extreme makeover Derby Con edition, day one, I started seeing immediate results. This was the first result. Okay, not expected, but uh, that's all right. I got, I got a new, got a new focus. I'm focused. This is good. Day one. Oops. Huh. Okay. Uh, day two. We went from a fifteen dollar water bill to a thousand dollar water bill. The second day after I made this great revelation of what I was going to do, and and the set the day the second day after I quit Offsec, thousand <laughs> dollar water bill, because we had a leak and we didn't know and they didn't find it and so it leaked for three months, right? The following day, thousand dollar electric bill went from eighteen dollars something like that a month to a thousand dollars. We're like, 
because of hot water heaters and just some crazy stuff that was going on. I'm like, are you serious, right? Like, this is nuts. It, get, it, get, it gets better. We had just decided to send our kids to boarding school uh, against what we thought was, was sanity. You know, I never thought I'd do this thing, but we'd been homeschooling them for three years, and it gotten to the point where it really sucked, and our kids were smarter than what we could throw at them. So this boarding school in Kenya, which is one of the best in the world, um, we got accepted to this place. And the reason that we got accepted is because somebody put in a good word for us, I'm pretty sure. One of the mission organizations that we helped out said, you know what, we couldn't do what we do without these guys. So this boarding school that's run by missionaries that only the missionaries get into first, and then if there's room, they let other people in, we got punched to the top of the line and called missionaries. And our kids, both of, both of our older kids got accepted. It was like, well, I'm not ready to let go of my kids. And uh, my discussion with my wife was like, well, why don't we ask the kids what they think about this? And the kids were like, oh, this is awesome. We're totally in. Our friends go there. Our other friends are going there next year. We're in. We're totally in. So my wife and I were like, yeah, okay. We looked at the numbers and, you know, the prices. And here's the missionary price. Oh, okay, we're missionaries. <laughs> here's the missionary price. You go. Uh, we're so excited for you. We showed up at the school. It was amazing. None of the teachers get paid because they raise their own support to be there. And that's the kind of teachers you want, right? It's, it was amazing. Well, this all happened in the midst of all this, but like three days, two days after I stepped away from OFSEC, we got the bill. And it was nearly double because guess what? You guys aren't missionaries. <laughs> I don't know who you were fooling. We let you in because you had a recommendation, but you're not missionaries. You're expats. Oh, but our kids are at the school already, and it's like, <laughs> what do we do? So now our kids are in a school where the tuition just doubled. Keeps getting better. We got a, we got a note from our landlord. So this was the immediate reaction to me taking on this, like, six-week makeover thing. And so this was me. <laughs> I'm like, what? Did, did I make a mistake? Really, this is what I'm supposed to do, and this is the response. <laughs> So I got to work, um, you know, and started focusing on HFC, stuck with the plan. Um, so basically what I'm going to show you um, between now and the end of the talk is, is not just what I've done, but kind of what you have done as a, you know, a result of giving your money and showing your support, um, and also what all of us collectively have done in the past year um, since last DerbyCon, and also what's happened in the past six weeks. Um, just to catch you up. So this is kind of what's going on with HFC. Um, I did an awful lot of support for uh, folks that were in Jinja that had come through with various equipment. This is a Mac Pro, and that's a bad picture. But um, having one of these things in Uganda is just a ridiculous concept. <laughs> there are no parts. It's a complete, you know, it's basically a non-standard system. You know, it's all aluminum. The grounding system is terrible. You know, it turns into a Tesla coil, <laughs> like that. It's got, it's got so many fans that it, it sucks in, you know, so much dirt that it, it grows plants between the heat and, and everything else. I mean, this is, this is a flower bed. <laughs> and it's in Uganda, and I'm repairing this stuff. Um, we started getting a really ridiculous amount of iPhones because all the volunteers would come over for their two weeks to do their important work. And their iPhone is their camera and their computer, and this is how they blog and talk to the people that are supporting them. So we get this ridiculous amount of iPhone repairs and unlocks. Um, and I'm not really good at this stuff. I mean, I was never a hardware guy, but, you know, I'm the computer wizard. And because of the restaurant at the Keep, we attract all the organizations that are working in the country. They come to our restaurant to enjoy the food, and they find out about the computer guy and so I spent a lot of time doing this stuff. Um, but like I said, I, I mean, I'm not great at it, but I just plugged away because the need was there, and I, I was the only one to fill it. Um, and, you know, every now and then something clicks, and, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, yay, <laughs> look, I did something. <laughs> Joe broke one of the 12 iPhones that came in because all of them updated to the latest iOS before they got on the plane. And I'm like, <laughs> you're hosed. But every now and then... Something good would happen. I got to work I work on some interesting hardware. These guys, water missions, um, they started doing wells. 
Um, now they do completely unattended um, monitoring systems for the water that can be completely reprogrammed and reporting done on them over 3G from your cell phone in this locked box that sits at the pump head. So they can tell how much water is being used, if there's any filtration problems, stuff like that. And, you know, these boxes get to the country and somebody needs to support them or in this particular case, extend the 3G range because they've got it so far deep in a village that there's no coverage. You know, so I'll get to work on stuff like this. This takes up a fair amount of, of my time, um, but it's, it's kind of a constant thing. Uh, those of you that uh, read the blog kind of know about this, um, but for those of you that don't, there was a, there, literally there was a fire in our backyard, uh, a little squatter village that was called Loco, which, um, you know, it looked like this. You know, this is, this is the blaze that happened literally in our backyard. Um, this is a, a little bit of video footage to kind of show you uh, what this thing looked like. It's, um, it's nuts. This was, this was really a scary, a scary <laughs> Too many, too many thieves were there before. I... And you can see people are going into the fire to rescue pieces of what's burning. <laughs> Throwing buckets of water at this thing. I mean, uh, they had absolutely no defense for this. The fire truck, the, the Jinja fire truck showed up and most of the water was gone before it got there because it had a huge leak in the tank. You know, so they'd show up, they'd, they'd get the thing primed up, they'd go, Psh, it would squirt a little bit of water, they'd shake it a little bit, they'd go back and refill it. I mean, we just watched this place get leveled. Um, and so I put it up on Facebook and basically said, man, I, I feel horrible for these people. They, these, were, these people were so far beyond below the poverty line that it was staggering. In one of the poorest countries in the world, these were like the poorest of the poor, and they just lost everything. Um, and I started getting a couple of responses on Facebook. Hey, can we send some money? And I was like, sure, we'll see what we can do. And we just basically engaged in this effort at first to feed them, because uh, they didn't have money, they didn't have food, they didn't have jobs. And this feeding program was a joint operation between hackers and uh, expats and missionaries and churches all working together to sort of get these people up and going. But the, uh, most of the funding came from hackers, came from people just like you. Um, you know, this is, this is a shot that kind of shows, this is everyone's belongings in five of the homes that burned down, five of the rooms, this little pile of stuff. This was like everything that they were able to get. So eventually the money started coming in, you know, a little more steadily and we moved beyond feeding them to start building. Um, we bought, you know, construction equipment and these are eucalyptus poles to do the framing. And this is kind of what we started with. I mean, this thing was raised to the ground. Um, we started building uh, frames, you know, and again, this is, you know, this is my wife, this is my kids, you know, uh, missionaries, churches, you know, all working, doing the work, but kind of you guys funding it. And in the end, this is, you know, this is how the work progressed. You know, we started, it started looking like something. And we kind of went from this to this. And then, you know, moved on and kind of went from this to this. And in this final picture, you can see, you know, these are some of the residents. And it was an amazing effort, you know, watching this kind of thing happen. Um, statistically, you guys built 28 rooms and saved 120 plus people just by sending money in this. And I think that's a huge deal. I mean, um, to me, that's, that's massive. The downside, however, um, was that um, after the fire, we delivered their homes. Um, we found out that most of the people that were there didn't have jobs to begin with. And the land that they're on is owned by the government. And they've got an eviction notice and they've got a year. We kind of knew this as we were building, but we're like, you know, we'll give them a year and we'll figure out the rest. Um, and so I started thinking, well, what kinds of things could we do to help these guys out? And right around the corner from this village is a, a leather tannering, tanning, tanning factory. And what they do is they tan leather, they send it, they chrome tan it, they send it to Italy. And in Italy, they process it to make Italian leather shoes and stuff like that. The other thing that was interesting about this tannery is that they sell most of their stuff to Kenya. Kenyans would make little crafts like bracelets and stuff to sell to the tourists that say Uganda. 
sell them back to Uganda, who would sell them to tourists. So the leather would go from being a block away from the shop to another country, sold back, and then bought by tourists. And I'm like, why isn't anybody doing any leather work? You know, this, would, this could be a really good job for them. And so um, HFC uh, spent some money on tools, some leather tools, and I dug into something I knew absolutely nothing about, which was leather work, and I'm like, this thing could work. We could start making stuff. And within the past six weeks, we started a leather project. And here you can see some of the residents actually working on these, these little cases. We're starting with these iPhone cases. This is one just made by the residents. It's very simply cut, very simply stitched. Um, but the money that comes out of this is enough to sustain the, you know, their entire family doing this little bit of work. So, you know, these are some of the things that we made. So those of you that have been by our booths have seen these things. This is just the beginning. We're looking, we have some ideas for doing, um, there's an iPad cover that's shown here. We're looking at doing things like billfolds, lockpick sets, cases for lockpick sets. Um, we bought some stamping equipment so we could like write the name of a, stamp the name of a con into a piece of leather and do things like lanyards or cases. And so that's the idea behind this, is taking the next step to get these folks on their feet. Those of you that have been around for a while know about our Food for Work program. Uh, and this started uh, way back in, I think it, it was like 2006, when I came out with No Tech Hacking. Um, I put this little thing on the, on the front cover that basically said, every time you buy a book, you're going to feed a kid. And that was because all my royalties were going into a food program to basically help people that didn't have anything. Um, and we did a lot with that money. Um, it went from, you know, just giving them food to giving them money so that they could start farms and fertilizer and teaching them how to farm. And then a percentage of the harvest would go back into the program so it was sustainable. Um, it was a great thing. But then the book stopped selling. The royalties disappeared. Um, and the thing kind of just fell fat, flat on its face. So within the past six weeks, that was one of the things that was kind of weighing on me a little bit. Um, Part of the reason that it was really weighing on me is I ran into this guy, Nathan, he's sitting right here. He came up to me at DEF CON and he was like, hey, I got a shirt for you. I'm like, okay. He yeah, gives me this shirt and it says, I am hacking world hunger. I'm like, oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's, that's kind of cute. I was like, nice shirt. You know, we had a brief conversation because I was going somewhere. And as I looked into this thing, I realized that what this guy was doing is he was printing t-shirts with his own money, taking the profits from it and funneling it back into our food program. I was like, you're doing what? <laughs> you know, he basically had this idea for revitalizing it. And these are his shirts. You know, he started selling these shirts. So this is why you see these shirts at our booth. These shirts actually go into our food program. Um, and it's kind of interesting because um, the profit margin on it goes into two separate things. One is feeding people who have absolutely nothing, just giving them food, and then giving them, um, you know, uh, let, let me talk about the shirt design first for a second. We're working on a new design based on the Hunger Games, which I think could be pretty clever with the, the next movie coming out. You know, tweaked it around a little and said, Hunger is no game. So the new shirts would look something like this. Um, and the way this, this breaks out with the money is, like I said, either feeding somebody that's got absolutely nothing costs $12 a month. The profit margin on the shirts right now is somewhere just around 15. So literally by buying one shirt, you're feeding a family for a month is how this thing works out. Um, in addition to doing that, we get them started with a kitchen garden, which is basically done in a sugar bag filled with dirt. You put dirt in there, you plant seeds, you water it, you go after it, and you have this garden growing when you have no land. Um, so that's the first thing we're doing. The second thing we're doing is for people that actually have land, instead of just giving them food, we give them farming supplies, teach them how to farm, give them fertilizer, seed. They do the harvest, they keep half of it. The other half goes back into the program to keep it sustained. And from their half, it takes about another half of that, so 25% of the harvest, to feed their family. The other 25% they can sell. So it kind of gets them ahead. And that costs 15 bucks a month. So the profit margin on the shirt is exactly enough to either feed a family or have someone farming for an entire month. So that's the food program. Um, our computer centers uh, have kind of been a big deal for us. I talked to you guys about the training center already. Um, this came out from the Ugandan Minister of Education. He basically said that in order to graduate from high school, 
you've got to have computer classes or sub math to graduate from high school. Well, there's two problems with this. One is that there's a, there's a real lack of good curriculum for math, science, and computer training. And in the way of computers, there's very few computers. So let me first talk about the curriculum. There's a lot of great curriculum out there. Uh, for example, Khan Academy, you guys probably all know about Khan Academy. Great material. Um, it's ridiculously big. Um, if you were to scrape, you know, if, if you're to download them, we don't have the bandwidth for that. If you're to scrape them and download the, the individual files, it's like 15 gigs worth of stuff and growing. It's this massive thing. So this group called Rachel at worldpossible.org pulled together a bunch of curriculum uh, like Khan Academy and Wikipedia and all this other stuff, put it into one package, and we've been deploying computers with all of this stuff on it into schools to use as curriculum. So without bandwidth, they've got a copy of Wikipedia, they've got all this stuff. However, there were a few holes, and this, this thing was kind of dangling, and in the past six weeks, I worked uh, with uh, Peter. How many of you know about Academy Pro, the videos that are on here? Great site for IT videos, learning how to configure just about every network device that's out there. Peter's based in Canada, it's an amazing site. His brother runs a thing though called the Academy Kids, which is just educational software and teaching kids lessons about English. So we pulled the Academy Kids stuff down and also GCF, which is put together by the Goodwill, that teaches computer training, and we lumped this into this massive package that we can deploy on like a Pentium 4. And my idea was, instead of doing these big classrooms, what I would do is I would take individual computers, one or two or three, and I'd put them in places that I thought would do some good with them, and I made it a contest. I was like, for this month, whoever trains the most kids, whoever has the most uh, people passing a certification, they come in, they use the computers, they go to our training center, they pass the certification. Whoever keeps the best care of the computers will give you more. And free tech support. And so that was the idea. So we started rolling out uh, computers. That was the second part of the equation. One was curriculum, the other one was computers. And of course there's very few in country. The schools can't care for the machines and the teachers lack training. So what we do is we bring the teachers into our training center right? We train them for free. Um, the training center is a really interesting place because um, in the beginning I tried to make it a business and I, like I said it was not profitable. So I would go back to the hacker community and say we need to run this thing. Would anybody be interested in sponsoring the rent and the salaries so that we can run this? Um, the Rapid7 paid for six months worth of rent and salaries to run this place. They also issued a challenge to the hacker community saying, we challenge you to raise another five. And the hacker community came back and raised like 6,200, not to be outdone by Rapid7, which was really cool. But because this thing was free now, I made the courses free. So now it was free computer training as long as we're able to fund it. So our teachers come in and they take courses from here, uh, folks that are working for nonprofits. This is the staff that we have right now. You recognize the DEF CON 20 shirts. None of them made it to DEF CON, obviously. But these folks are taking care of the training center and they're doing an amazing job. Some of the quotes that we get from the center are amazing. It's called the Hackers for Charity Computer Training Center. So of course we're getting people that are coming in saying, hey, teach me how to hack. I'm like, this sounds like my inbox, but We've got employment recruiters coming into the center, talking to the students, looking to hire them from job, for jobs. And of course, our staff is now getting to the point where they're getting people coming in that think they're smarter than the instructors. And I find it very interesting that our instructor's motto is patience is a virtue. You know, they've really shown some really good resilience um, in doing this training. We train uh, government, we train police, we train nonprofits. Um, this picture shows motorcycles. Motorcycles, or boda bodas as they're called, is a primary means of transportation. Being a motorcycle driver is dangerous. The pay isn't very good. So I drive past these boda drivers every day. At one point I stopped and I said, do you guys want to do this forever? They're like, no. I'm like, what do you want to do? And one of the guys like, I want to, I want to learn computers. So we started bringing motorcycle drivers in. 
And now I've got the supervisor coming and saying, I need you to stop this because I'm losing Boda drivers. They all want to be computer guys. So training Boda drivers. We also go, out, these guys also go out into the schools and give talks. Um, we had some projectors that were donated to us, some little LED projectors. So our staff goes out into the schools and gives lessons. It's really an amazing thing. This is the list of organizations that we trained last year, a bunch of them. Some statistics. Last year we trained 537 students. 279 of those were individuals not related to a nonprofit, so they basically just walked in the door. And we provided 9,184 total hours of free training last year out of the training center, which is pretty amazing. It averages 17 hours of training per student. And this is a message that our staff wanted to give to you guys. <laughs> um, we would like to extend our appreciation to Johnny Long and the sponsors of Hackers for Charity. Thanks for the great work you're doing. This is from the workers. Not only do they have great jobs, but they love what they're doing so much. They want you to know that they appreciate you. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, in wrapping up, uh, like I said, we started doing these little micro centers around for the people that couldn't get into our training center. Uh, one that we did in the past six weeks was for Ginger Connection. This is a group that caters to street kids, brings them in, gives them an education, gives them a lunch, you know, gives them a place to stay. We built uh, a bunch of Pentium 4s that had been donated, started putting them together. You know, everything goes great in Uganda until you get to the very end. This looks nice, but nothing is standard. <laughs> you know, so we're full of surprises. But in the end, we were able to deploy this really nice little training center for these guys. Um, here's some of the street kids that are using it. They're sending us pictures all the time. A lot of these kids have never touched a computer. We did a, a, one of these at Children of Grace. One of the things that was cool about this um, is this was installed at the beginning of the year, and at the end of the year it looked exactly the same. They kept it so neat. They were sending us these pictures. And I got this great story about this, this uh, young guy. His name's Umaru. He's a senior five student. That's him in the front. His goal is to become a civil engineer, but he failed his class because he couldn't get hands-on computer time because their school didn't have computers. So now, after training on our systems, he's at the top of his class, and he's earned a full scholarship as a result of taking computer training. Now, the last center that I want to show you in the last couple minutes that we have here, um, we set up in the north. How many of you know about Invisible Children? Okay. Um, Invisible Children basically is a group that focuses in northern Uganda, which is one of the most war-torn places on the planet. Um, it's a group run by Joseph Kony, and what he does is he recruits children into the military. Usually the first act of service when he recruits them is that he has, they have to kill their parents to show that they're loyal to the cause. As a result, 95% of the Acholi people in northern Uganda were displaced and put into camps. A thousand people dying a week. It was the AIDS hotspot of the planet because all these people were shuffled together to protect them from the LRA. There was no schooling in the camps, which basically means an entire generation was lost in those camps. We worked, we had a group come, uh, a couple come into the keep and we learned about their story. They're working in northern Uganda with the kids that were affected by the LRA. Their goal was to create a school not just a school, but a school that had Western standards. They want their kids to be able to go to American universities and European universities. They set the bar really high. And the more I listened to their story, I was like, we need to help them, you know, with the curriculum that we have. So we took a trip up to northern Uganda, um, amazing place. Um, but, of course, things are very different than where we live. We're in a bit of a tourist town. We don't have to truck in water or you know, haul cows around on, on motorcycles to get them in or anything like that. But once we got up into northern Uganda and we saw this school, we just knew that this place was special. So I want to wrap up with just a short video that talks about the computer center that we, uh, that we installed there and then uh, talk about uh, our project that we're releasing uh, for DerbyCon. So here you go. I'm Keith Coggin. Uh, I'm the director of Sanctuary of Grace Christian Academy in Gulu, Uganda. Uh, we have been in, in Uganda now for 10 years and have uh, 
moved up to Gulu and started the school in 2007. And I'm Lisa Coggan, and I'm the director of the school, director of education of our school here in Gula. We also have another school in Kitgum, and we hope to have many more. Uh, Museveni, the president of Uganda, decided that in 1996 that they would start moving all of the people from their villages into camps. So they would take a, uh, a trading center and they would place people in there, pull them out of their, uh, their village that they lived in and put them in one central place, supposedly to protect them. And uh, it would just grow and grow and grow. And you had, at the time we started coming up here, there was about 115 camps. Um, they had started in 1996. And the camps ranged from about 5,000 people to uh, the largest camp was Pabo and it was 65,000 people in one small area and they're all crammed in there together. People were losing their identities. You know, these, some of these people were very prominent at one time and uh, they had cattle, they had land, they were able to, to grow crops and sell them to the south and now they, they, can't, they can't do any of that because they're moved into these camps and they're told if you leave the camps, then the, the UPDF, the Ugandan army, uh, is liable to, to shoot you because they think you're a rebel. If you're out there digging and they decide the, the LRA comes up, then they are liable to kill you. So uh, you, you, you're really in a cage. You can't leave, you can't dig, you can't do anything. And so they all are mixed in there together and they start brewing alcohol, there's uh, promiscuity, all of these things which promotes AIDS and, and other, you know, STDs. AIDS is very high because of the fact that you had 1.6 million people crammed into these close quarters of the camps. And so they had nothing to do but, you know, I guess you would say sleep around or, and drink alcohol, which when uh, they would they would take whatever the World Food Program would bring, like the maize for their posho and things like that, and they would turn it into to alcohol. And so the men would, would sit around and have these parties, and they would get drunk, and then they would go back, and they would either rape or, or just sleep around with, with other women. Um, so it, it spread very quickly. It was very difficult for the men to, that were used to providing for their families to be in this situation where they just sit around and do nothing. We came to Uganda about 10 years ago and uh, we worked down in Jinja at an orphanage. And as we were working there, we began to hear from some of our employees that um, the horror that was going on in northern Uganda with the um, insurgency is what they call it. We, many people call it a war, but we don't call it a war. We call it a horrible insurgency, and so uh, the LRA. And we began to think about children again. You know, what's happening to the children? We hear they're sleeping in the streets. We hear they're without education. We hear they live in camps. And so we began coming up here in about 2003, and then our heart was just moved to shift up here and do something to help the children, especially the children of the next generation because what are their parents going to be able to give them? Um, their, their parents have no education. 20 years of insurgency, that's an entire generation with no education, uh, disruption of normal life, living in camps that um, are crowded and they're not allowed to leave. With not being able to move out, uh, then they, they don't have a way to eat and the government is not helping them. They're not bringing food in. And so after a few years, the World Food Program decided they would start helping. So now, for the last, from 1996 up until 2006, when the, the insurgency ended, you've got someone providing the food for them. And you've got a, a generation of, of children that are grown up in these camps that have no village life whatsoever. And it, it's, it, it was really, crippling to the society as a whole. They're still in that uh, 
survival society to where they don't know how to do anything, so they're depending on someone else. originally to work with orphans, but then we found that all of New York, Northern Uganda is an orphan. And so uh, we realized that education was a key to um, helping to form a new world, a new way of thinking, a new hope for the future. And so we started a school instead. Now, all of a sudden, uh, the war is over and, and uh, technology is coming and nobody knows how to to deal with it really. They get all of the computers and all of the new electronics and, and they really are not up on how to use those. Uh, so with our school here in the village especially, where most of the parents of the children here are, are still illiterate because they, the education system was shut down during the, the insurgency. The village was crying for education. They said our kids are not educated and we can, we're not educated. We can't help them. They need schools. They need, um, and they need help for the future. And they were, when I say they were crying, they were literally crying for us to do something to help their children, to give them a hope. And so we opened a school. But uh, Uganda is notorious for a very sorry education system. Uh, the education system is, is ancient, it's antiquated, it's limited, it's fragmented, and it doesn't teach reasoning and concepts, it only teaches rote and, and just um, uh, observable information so that they can pass the test and get a piece of paper. We have an opportunity here with uh, Hackers for Charity uh, donating this, this uh, system for the computer lab to give these children that are coming up in this village a, a opportunity to learn from an early age how to, to take this technology and manage it. And so we appreciate so much that we're able to, to provide this for these children. And Hackers for Charity has, has done a great job of, of coming and setting it up and now we have to be the ones to, to use it to help these children in the new world that's up and coming. And so, um, so we're excited about what, what's going to happen and we're excited about the, the reports that we're going to be able to give um, for the future of how the children are going to be learning and changing and, and uh, the information that is held in the system is, is a school in itself and so we're excited about using it and we hope to learn from it too. Cool. <laughs>
But not only can you sign up as a volunteer, you can come in as a charity and say, I need this thing done. Here's my need. It's going to plot it geographically on a map. If you want to do something in your own backyard, you can look geographically and say, hey, what's around my hacker space or what's in my neighborhood to find things to do. And the third way that you can sign up is as a donor. We've talked about hardware in the past. It's not going to Uganda anymore. We want to see the hardware and stuff that you guys have being used here because there's, there's incredible need here and all over the world, not just in Uganda. So whether you're interested in being a volunteer, you're a charity, or you're a donor, this application is waiting for your registration. It's a little bit empty. We only have a few charities on there. But part of this is on you guys to look around to find the need. But once you do, this application is the gateway, and it gets us out of the middle to just doing some good. OK? So hackersforcharity.org, the center link is right there. Um, the other things that you can do, Metasploit Unleashed. Every time you make a donation to this course, it goes to HFC. So I really want to encourage you guys to use that. Um, the Metasploit book, um, you know, Dave's here. These guys have been huge supporters of ours for a very long time. We're very appreciative of them. Um, support them by buying this book. And, and no tech hasn't dated a whole lot. You know, it's still pretty relevant. But again, all those proceeds from the t-shirts and also the book sales are going to be going into that. So uh, make sure you take that out. I'm, I'm sorry. I know I'm very much over time. Um, I apologize for slowing the day down. But I just want to thank you guys so much. Thank you to DerbyCon, to Dave, to all the staff that makes DerbyCon possible. Your support made a huge difference this year. Um, also, the volunteers, Glenn, Sam, Justin, Mary, Vito, all these guys that are doing so much work. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you for kicking me in the butt. Um, I don't know what's next in terms of finances. I'm going to keep heads down with HFC because that's what I feel like I'm supposed to do. Um, but thank you guys so much for your continued support. Really appreciate you guys. And we'll have questions at the booth. Yeah, if you guys have questions, we'll be over at the booth. Thanks a lot.